Looking like a snuggle-toothed Neanderthal, Nicholas or Klaus Sturtebeker was said to have lived at the turn of the 14th century, although exactly when he died is still a little uncertain. Sturtebeker led a notorious band of privateers known as the Victual Brothers or Vitalian Bruder in the original German. Originally hired to fight the Danish during a war between Denmark and Sweden, Sturtebeker and his band of Victual Brothers continued their practical ways after the war, but little is known for certain about the group. The Victual Brothers and Klaus Sturtebeker stand tall as some of the most famous figures in Hamburg's history, with Sturtebeker himself being one of the most notorious pirates in medieval Europe. But what was the story of the man who could down four leaders in one gulp? And why do Germans still celebrate him to this day? Welcome to Walk the Plank. The Man, the Legend. In the late 19th century, workers unearthed a skull on the island of Grasbrook, part of modern-day Hafen City in Hamburg. Due to its location and some of the damage done to the skull, it's been identified as the earthly remains of Klaus Sturtebeker, pirate, buccaneer, and living legend. The stories about Sturtebeker mostly focus on his enormously successful career as a pirate on the seas, but it seems that he started to get a name for himself even on land. In 1380, the records claim that there was an incident where two men were thrown out of Weismar, northern Germany, for general drunken debauchery and misbehavior. One of these men was called Niccolo Strauterberger, and his entanglement in a violent fistfight laid the groundwork for his later exploits, not least his ability to drink. Strauterberger's surname may actually be more a descriptive nickname than anything else, as it can be translated from German to down the beakerful, perhaps referencing his apparent ability to drink a full four-liter mug of beer in a single swallow. Things are quiet for the next nine years, with no reference to Strauterberger until he began his semi-legitimate career in the late 1300s as part of the marine defense of Mecklenburg, now northern Germany. Charged with defending exposed towns against Danish ships as part of the ongoing war between Sweden and Denmark, Sturtebeker was given a ship and a crew and let loose on the Baltic Sea, much to people's chagrin. In 1389, we get the first official mention of the Victual Brothers. A town council responded to a man called Revel, who had complained about the fact that they had sold ships to a group known as Die Vitlimbruder. This nickname indicates that they were well known around the Baltic in this period, both as mercenaries and marauders. The next year, records show that the Hamburg Chamber of Finance had funded an expedition to seek out and destroy the Vitalenesses, the Latinized version of the Vitalenbrud. Sturtebeker seems to have spent a few years working for the Mecklenburg royal family, harassing Danish ships for King Albrecht III of Sweden in an attempt to get Queen Margaret of Norway to give up her claim to the throne. These lofty political issues were far above Sturtebeker and the rest of the Victual Brothers. More concerned with where their next meal was coming from than who was ruling the country, Sturtebeker and his crew must have jumped at the chance to get off the farm. Life in medieval Germany would have been harsh, with most people relying on agriculture for their livelihood. Career progression was an unknown concept for most Germans in the medieval period, and it seems that a life on the open ocean would have been a far more appealing prospect for many. And where does the nickname De Wiedlund Brood come from? It appears that while working for the Mecklenburg family, Sturtebeker and his men were tasked with supplying the besieged city of Stockholm with supplies. Successfully navigating their way through treacherous waters and enemy ships, Sturtebeker and the crew were welcomed with open arms and dubbed the Victual Brothers for their efforts. It seems that they weren't always bringing sustenance to their friends though, as one Franciscan friar reported that Sturtebeker had disrupted the herring trade and blockaded the port of Scania, leading to an increase in the price of the salted fish. After the war. When Queen Margaret and King Albrecht finally brokered a fragile peace in the late 1390s, Sturtebeker realized that he'd got a taste for life on the high seas and didn't want to give it up. Although trade in the Baltic Seas was dominated by a trade alliance known as the Hanseatic League, Sturtebeker knew that he could take advantage of his intimate knowledge of the seas between Hamburg and other port towns. He set up base in Gotland and turned the main port town of Visby into a sort of pirate stronghold. He held out for several years, pilfering gold and goods from the trade routes between Hamburg and Rostock, until the island of Gotland was invaded and the pirates were driven out. They settled on the rugged coast of the North Sea in what is now modern-day Holland, but then called Frisia. Finding a common enemy in the English, the Victual brothers started targeting English ships, but not for long. After only a couple of years in Frisia, Sturtebeker's luck ran out as he crossed paths for the final time with the German fleet. A Dead Man Walking The story goes that Sturtebeker's forces were finally pinned down by Simon of Utrecht in 1401. 
after years of terrorizing the seas around northern Germany. According to some sources, Stratoberger was betrayed by a member of his crew who threw molten lead onto the chain that controlled the ship's rudder, meaning that the ship was left dead in the water and vulnerable to attack. After his capture, Stratoberger and his crew were taken to Hamburg and tried for several counts of piracy. Not one to give up without a fight or a bribe, Stratoberger is said to have offered a chain of gold long enough to encircle Hamburg in exchange for his freedom, but to no avail. Stratoberger was in fact incredibly wealthy as a result of his successful career in piracy, but it didn't matter. He was sentenced to death along with his companions, doomed to being beheaded on Grasbrook Island, an island in the middle of the Elbe in Hamburg. Despite being sentenced to death, Stratoberger wouldn't give up so easily. According to legend, the pirate asked the mayor of Hamburg to pardon as many of his brothers as he could walk past after he was beheaded. Clearly thinking that this was impossible, his request was granted and the executioner duly did his duty and beheaded Stratoberger. Stratoberger then got back up again, minus his head, and started to stumble along the line of men waiting for their own execution. After Stratoberger's headless corpse had ambled past 11 men, the executioner stuck his foot out and stripped Stratoberger to the ground. Despite saying that they'd spare any of his men that his corpse could walk past, the Germans went back on their word and Stratoberger's companions were sentenced to death, along with the rest. Their heads were then stuck on pikes outside the walls to warn other bandits of the harsh sentence that awaited them if they turned to a life of crime. An entertaining footnote to Stratoberger's execution story goes that the executioner finished decapitating the 70 prisoners and leaned on his axe. The city councillors asked if his arms were now tired, and he jokingly replied that he was fine and even had enough energy to carry on, even to behead the whole senate. This didn't go down well with the senate, and the executioner himself was sentenced to death for his own poor joke. Stratoberger's Spoils Stratoberger had become a bit of a Robin Hood character for Germany, and has been revived as a folk hero at various points over the last century, including at the turn of the century. Since 1959, there have been numerous plays about his exploits that have been shown at the Stratoberger Festipiel, which is held each year at Rügen. And in 2007, 378,000 people went to the festival. His growing popularity in the 2000s was partly in response to Germany's economic crisis and the sense of injustice and inequality that people felt was creeping into society. In 2009, a film called 12 Paces Without a Head was made about his life and career, which neatly summed up the German sentiment towards their rugged hero. He butchered people, but also has a very, very big heart. Despite the fact that the Victual brothers were literal criminals, they are still remembered fondly. According to legend, Stratoberger was generous to both the poor and his crew members alike. He shared the wealth equally among his band of privateers, giving rise to the epithet like dealers as the band all benefited from their criminal exploits. It seems that there is no end to the things that pirates will do with their gold, and Stratoberger was no exception. His ship was not the average pirate vessel. When it was found, the mast was said to be filled with precious metal. One contained a solid silver core, one was filled with copper, and the final filled with pure gold. His ill-gotten gold was reclaimed by the city of Hamburg, and was said to have been used to create the tip of St. Catherine's Church in Hamburg. In 2010, Stroekeberger's remains once again hit the headlines as his skull was stolen from the Hamburg Museum. Although the skull has generally been accepted to be Stroekeberger's thanks to the fact that it was discovered to have had a spike driven through it, it has not been fully concluded that this skull did actually belong to the pirate. In 2008, the museum tried to confirm that this skull was Stroekeberger's by taking DNA samples from people who might be his descendants, as well as DNA from the skull itself. The results were inconclusive, but the skull was still displayed in the Museum of Hamburg History, as well as a digital reconstruction of Stroekeberger's face taken from the skull itself. His skull wasn't away from home for long though, as it turned up less than a year later and is back on display with improved security. Was he real? As with all historical figures, it's hard to separate fact from fiction. We know that there was a man called Niccolo Stroekeberger who was enough of a drunkard to get kicked out of Weismar in 1380, and we can be certain that there was a group of privateers who caused havoc for the Hanseatic League in the Baltic Sea. Whether these two are as closely linked as the stories indicate is a different matter. It seems as though the Victual brothers could have continued their operations after Stroekeberger's death in 1401, with references dating up to the late 1460s. And then there's the name, Stroekeberger. It's more the sort of name given to someone as a joke in the pub, rather than being someone's real given surname. Does this mean that Stroekeberger wasn't real? Absolutely not, but as always, these tall tales of piracy and daring need to be taken with a pinch of salt. 
At the end of the day, enough truth remains in the story for us to know that a band of pirates terrorized the Baltic for decades, harnessing the rich merchants in their undefended shipping lanes and taking what they wanted, when they wanted. And finally, it tells the story that people still identify with today, that of a man who stood up against inequality and fought for his freedom to live the life he wanted. Thank you for watching this episode of Walk the Plank, please do subscribe if you're enjoying these videos, and I'll see you next week for another one. Have a great week, cheers!